Welcome to Careers in the Cloud, Take Your Developer Career to the Next Level. My name is Kim Wallens-Friedman, and I am founder and CEO of Hire on Demand and will be your host today for today's careers webinar. I am thrilled to announce that I am here with two really esteemed members of the Salesforce developer community. Uh, we are joined by Michael Fulmore, who is currently Director of Product Development at eVariant, and with David Liu, who is Salesforce Technical Architect at Google. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items to cover. One is safe, Salesforce's Safe Harbor Statement. If you're not familiar with the statement, it advises us to not make any purchasing decisions based on anything that you may hear on today's call. And if you're interested in reading more, you can find this list located on Salesforce's website. Also, there are a number of ways to connect with Salesforce. As you can see through the various channels here and handles to go social with Salesforce. And should anyone have any questions, there will be questions answered throughout today's webinar, as well as we'll be doing a, Q, a live Q&A towards the end of the webinar. So stay tuned there and you'll be able to input your questions and we'll get to as many of them as we are able to. And also, we for anyone that did register for today's webinar, this will be recorded and will be posted within a week's time. And you'll everybody that registered will receive an email alerting us to when that does get posted. So as far as today's agenda, what we'll be covering, uh, first I'll start off with some introductions. And then I'll move on and talk to the Force.com career landscape. Then we'll move on to speaking with both Dave and Mike. I'll be interviewing both of them. Uh, and We'll, it will be a great opportunity to hear directly from them as they both have really unique stories to tell and different paths that they've taken um, to attain the success that they have in Salesforce development. And then lastly, we'll open it up to Q&A. So first, a little bit about myself. Um, I am a former Salesforce.com employee and have been now in the Salesforce space for 10 years and have been in technology recruiting for a little over that amount of time as well. Um, I've presented at Dreamforce for the last six years and have spoken across the U U.S. Um, over the last number of years uh, talking to trends in the Salesforce career space and launched Higher On Demand in 2007. So a little bit about Hire On Demand. We are a specialty recruiting firm dedicated exclusively to Salesforce talent and jobs and the services that we provide. So we place Salesforce professionals in both full-time permanent as well as contract or project-based job opportunities. And as you can see listed here, we really staff any kind of job that's tied to Salesforce, ranging from developers and architects to management, administrators, you name it. If it's tied to Salesforce in some way, uh, that's our, our wheelhouse. And now to introduce my guest speakers today, uh, Michael Fulmore, who is, as I mentioned, Director of Product Development at eVariant. Uh, he also came um, previously from working at Facebook and started his career right here at Salesforce. So we'll have a really good story to hear from him in a little bit. And David, who has been voted a Salesforce MVP um, twice, uh, has spoken also at Dreamforce, is certified, and he has also a very uh, interesting uh, path and some great tips to share. So first, a little bit about the Force.com career landscape and even broader, just the cloud landscape. I think at this point, most of us know and see that from a technology standpoint, everything is trending towards the cloud. And in fact, Gartner stated this past year that by 2016, all large global enterprises will be using some level of cloud services. Specifically, as it relates to Salesforce, we can see that this demand um, is growing at a very, very rapid rate. And this slide here talks to a little bit of background as to why we're seeing this happen. Um, so a little history, Salesforce was launched in 1999. And the first thing that happened that was very relevant from a, a development standpoint is that in 2005, Salesforce launched their App Exchange. 
And what that is, is a, an online public marketplace of applications that have all been built on top of the force.com platform and are available. Some of them are, are free of charge and others are, are fee based. Um, and this, for the first time, allowed developers to start to get creative and build any kind of application and make that available to the general public. In 2007 and 2008 is when something very, very profound took place, and that is when Salesforce, for the first time ever, unveiled their Force.com platform to the public. So they basically shared with the public their own proprietary uh, language that they used to build their own CRM product. That language is called Apex. It's very similar to Java. Shortly thereafter, Visual Force was announced, which basically now allowed uh, developers to not only uh, directly impact the way Force or Salesforce or any of the apps on the platform behaved, but it also allowed them to fully um, take charge of the look and feel. And that ultimately is what was the genesis and where the title of a Salesforce developer was born. And then more recently in 2013, Salesforce launched their Salesforce One platform that, again, was benefiting developers by allowing them to build it once and be able to deploy that code and that application out to any kind of device. So what are some of the things that we see from our, our customers or companies that are using Salesforce and why are they needing to hire developers? So some of the hot buttons today are integrations. Companies are integrating Salesforce with all kinds of backend systems and other applications. They're building new applications on top of the platform and oftentimes replacing legacy applications on top of Salesforce's platform. Enhancing the CRM program programmatically is a really uh, hot area. And lastly, as we're seeing everything is connected in smart devices and appliances with the Internet of Things, there, this um, is allowing developers to take their creative work in all kinds of directions. So what does that mean in terms of career options for a Salesforce developer? Well, there are a number of different titles that have evolved over the last several years in this particular space. Uh, one is a developer, so someone that's doing the hands-on code. Uh, architects are, are individuals who are focused on design. So they've already typically been a developer and are either designing how an application will be built or perhaps designing just how all the systems within an organization are going to connect and talk to each other. Uh, you, we have analysts, where those are individuals who are interfacing with the business and the key stakeholders to really understand the business requirements and collaborate closely with a developer or architect, or maybe are even two and uh, one one person doing all of the above. Uh, product management, someone like Mike Fulmar, um, who's very um, having a very direct impact on a product roadmap and what that should look like uh, as a product advances. And lastly, management uh, is, is a hot button for companies currently as they're hiring teams of Salesforce development folks. Um, they are really there are need for leadership to manage those teams. And in terms of a career path, um, while there really isn't one set path, what you see in front of you is, is a very common one um, taken by folks that are doing um, Salesforce development, where someone may start off as a developer move into either um, tech, technical or solutions architecture, perhaps move into product management, and lastly, um, move into leadership. And you see that the arrow here is moving in both direction and direct directions. And the reason for that is that we do see a lot of people kind of shift ac across this plane um, where a lot of people, for example, who are in management are missing some of the hands-on, and so they may move back to a, an architect or developer position or what have you. And so what are the types of companies that are hiring people with Salesforce development skills? Um, one would be uh, in-house, so just like what we see a Mike or a David working at a Variant or a Google. Um, two would be consulting firms, and that could be anything from the big four like an Accenture to a, a smaller Salesforce implementation consulting firm that's responsible for either deploying or optimizing Salesforce's customers. And three, we see ISVs or independent software vendors who are responsible for building uh, applications to then market out to the public, and those applications are all built on top of the Force.com platform. 
And so a little bit about what the job landscape is looking like today. Um, in short, it's nuts. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Um, f- one of the reasons for that is that demand really exceeds supply. And part of the reason for this, I think it's important for people to understand, is that with the Force.com platform only being on the market for six years, there is a very finite pool of people globally that know how to work on this platform. And uh, in fact, um, training, so higher on demand, we staff Salesforce with their first Force.com technical instructors uh, about five years ago. And so the amount of training that's been able to be disseminated globally is still fairly limited, yet we see companies all over the world who understand all of the capabilities of the platform and are very excited and therefore demand is just has spiked incredibly. Developers are seeing multiple job offers as a result. We see companies competing for talent, salaries that are at, at an all-time high, and I'll talk to that in a moment. Benefits are very rich, and it's exciting to see that women um, are starting to really um, make a move and work with the Force.com platform. So speaking of the salary trends, um, this is something that is probably a phenomenon that's going to continue in this direction for some time based on the supply and demand that we're seeing. So we can see that um, Force.com developers' salaries are um, well exceeding those uh, at this point of either someone that may have come from a Java or a .NET background. Um, these salaries listed are an average salary um, across the United States, um, and these are reflecting base salaries. Um, typically, you do see a bonus on top of this. In terms of technical trends, we're seeing developers focus on specialties, whether it be focusing on a particular Salesforce cloud, such as the service or marketing cloud. And we're also seeing developers focus on verticals with healthcare and finance being two very hot ones uh, at the moment. We're seeing a lot of companies just reinventing themselves on the Salesforce platform, whether that be an actual like, corporation or an ISV. Integrations we spoke to, going mobile is hot, as is the Internet of Things. From a, a benefits standpoint to developers as part of a compensation package uh, and just everything that kind of surrounds that, we see that developers are having the opportunities to work a day or two from home. Um, we're also seeing uh, companies hiring developers just in different parts of the uh, of the country or different countries um, where they are working entirely remote and given the nature of the cloud, that's a very doable thing. We're seeing companies offer equity, uh, offering flexibility in terms of how a job might be structured, whether it's a full-time position or a contract role based on basically the, the interests of the developer. We're seeing a lot of companies sending their talent, their professionals to cl- various cloud events like a Dreamforce. And also we're seeing them um, pay um, for their employees training. So how do we, how do you get started if you're thinking or considering the Force.com platform uh, as, as a development career? One is to note that Salesforce has a very active community. As you saw from some of the handles earlier on this call, there's a lot of ways to connect with Salesforce. And people in the Salesforce community are very giving and sharing. And there is just a lot of knowledge share across. Um, So taking advantage of that. You can also download a free copy of Salesforce's Developer Edition. There are lots of classes available, whether they're online or in person, free or fee-based. It's also great if you're getting started, if you're able to join a company that has SeniorForce.com developers who you can learn from. And lastly, hands-on experience. Um, I can't emphasize that enough, is that's what we hear from our our customers, uh, is the number one thing that they want to see in their new hires. And so whether that may be uh, an opportunity for someone to gain some volunteer experience or any kind of route or avenue where someone's able, an internship, anything to get some hands-on is really viewed as valuable by employers. Now, if you're already an established Salesforce.com developer, what are some ways that we see developers advance and or have success in advancing their careers? 
One is specializing, um, finding that having a niche um, is being perceived as highly valuable to companies today. Uh, building a proof of concept. So let's say you attend Dreamforce and learn some great ideas. Um, take it to the next step. Go ahead and try to build something out and demonstrate it to management. That's oftentimes a very useful means of being able to actually take action on certain initiatives. Working at consulting firms is also a, a great way to gain exposure to multiple industries and companies and environments and be able to really analyze and, and take advantage of Salesforce through very many different uh, channels. Don't be afraid to push the limits. Companies love this. Employers that are hiring love to know that they're hiring developers that have really kind of thought through around, let's sales, say, Salesforce's governor limits or what have you, and kind of have been able to come up with creative workarounds. Contributing to the community. Um, joining a company with executive sponsorship is really key. So when you know that executives are behind it, that usually means that there is a good opportunity for um, various projects on the platform. And also talking to like a recruiting firm, like a higher on demand, where we are talking to the hiring companies all day, every day, and we're happy to always offer insight into things that you may be able to do to help advance your career. So without further ado, I'm excited to... and I. Uh, add uh, both Mike and David to the conversation now, um, and they have some really, I think, useful real-world tips to share with um, people that are listening in. And I am going to start with um, Mike Fulmore. So Mike, as we mentioned, is currently a director over product development. Um, and Mike, I'd love just to get started. If you could share with everyone how you first started out with the force.com platform and then if you can just briefly walk us through your career trajectory. Great. Thanks, Kim. Uh, that was an awesome overview of the salesforce.com career path and uh, really a lot of helpful tips uh, in there. So I was extremely fortunate to be at Salesforce when the API or the web services API was really being thought of and, and what needs to happen to support customers with integrations and building building extensions and then that morphed into building Apex and, and those sorts of things. So I, uh, you know, I was fortunate in that it was put right in front of me and it was just there for me to grab. Uh, but my career path I think is um, applicable to people outside of Salesforce as well. Um, my, my basic one, you know, the theme that ran true throughout my career at Salesforce and then later at Facebook was taking on a problem or a project that was just a little bit outside of my comfort zone. Not, not in panic mode, I didn't want to take anything that was so advanced that I couldn't get it done, I couldn't show success. But something that was just out of my reach. I didn't really understand the full gravity of the, of the project because I didn't understand how it would be implemented. Um, and I just followed this pattern throughout my career and that led me to, you know, taking um, night classes, going back to school and taking night classes in Java or uh, C Sharp or any object-oriented language, taking classes in JavaScript front-end development uh, to understand those technical aspects, and then to apply those development principles, um, you know, through reading, and I mean, you can go online now. I think, I think I've hired multiple engineers um, as I became a hiring manager. That some of them didn't even graduate high school. You know, they were at the technology at the point now is the information is just out there. You just have to go teach yourself. Mm -hmm. um, or follow a, a teaching path, and that's really, uh, the, really what I want to emphasize is learning technology. It, all the information is at your fingertips. It's all on the internet. It's um, all a Google search away. So that's my general theme. And throughout my career at Salesforce, um, I guess I, I have one claim to fame. I'm in a small um, handful of people who uh, developed applications on. Uh, on Apex a year before it was generally available to the public. So I can say that I was the first Apex developer or one of the first. I think there was 10 of us uh, to do that. So that, that's kind of unique and, um, and I like I, uh, this little anecdote on my uh, career. But 
um, for the for the most part, yeah, just t- stay right out of that comfort zone, learning, you know, burning the midnight oil. Yes, and sometimes you'll have to do two jobs at the same time, uh, but but just getting to that next level and then becoming a student of software development is uh, is what I would recommend. Great. And then as you kind of advanced beyond Salesforce, Mike, um, if you can briefly talk to what you've done post Salesforce and and why you decided to continue working with the Force.com platform. Great. So my first uh, job outside of Salesforce was working at Facebook. And the project that I um, took on at Facebook was um, uh, the host uh, tracking through Salesforce. So you could imagine Facebook has lots and lots of servers. There's a public number, uh, but there's a lot of servers that run Facebook. Um, And we needed to build an application that tracked those servers, tracked the health of those servers, tracked the repair process for those servers, and tracked the parts inventory that is used to be put to fix those servers. That was all built on the Force.com platform and integrated with a lot of systems, both homegrown applications and also Oracle type based applications and and other web service, or excuse me, other uh, cloud uh, applications. The numbers there were were pretty pretty astounding. Uh, We were able to increase the um, industry, uh, get, get above the industry average of technicians per servers for repair. So we were able to utilize the the rapid development process on Salesforce.com and the Force.com platform to get that application out to the users and then also the efficiencies that we could gain from the application we were able to increase um, that number and that number equates to real dollars when you're when you're at when you're at such a large scale like Google and Facebook. So that was I was really proud of that application and that really launched me into you know got me out of the nest, got me that I could, I proved that the Force.com platform and my skills were able to to be developed at scale. Um, I later moved on into management and managed the team that that ran that application and then just uh, was able to move to Evariant, get back to my healthcare uh, love, I have just a passion for healthcare, and uh, able to take a job managing uh, a large scale team of building our, our, we're at ISV to Salesforce, and we're building our application on the Force.com platform. Or it's live now, but we're improving it. Great. Uh, and if you had a name, maybe with the one coolest thing that you've done on the Force.com platform, Mike, what would that be? Um, well, <laughs> actually, I, I, I was going to say, oh, the server tracking thing, but that's actually pretty boring. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was an application I built for the Salesforce Foundation. Um, it, that was probably one of the most fun projects I had because, uh, and, and it brings me to another way to, you know, if you're looking for a project, there are hundreds, heck, there's probably 150 to 200 um, uh, foundations in San Francisco alone within a stone's throw of Salesforce that would love to have a night or weekend help, uh, pro bono help to get your feet in the uh, wet on the force.com platform but yeah I, I built an application I don't remember all the particulars but that was just the fun that was just the funnest application to build because the people uh, that were building it for were just so happy to solve these problems they were just so grateful uh, working with foundations typically uh, they pay with a smile and sometimes a smile is uh, you know even more uh, satisfying than hmm. you know getting money for your for your effort. So it was really nice to help a good cause and to um, you know learn. I learned a ton about the platform at that point too as well. Yeah. Yeah, it great. Was great. Um, well thanks for sharing. And lastly Mike, if you had to give the top one or two tips um, for somebody, a developer who's looking to advance their Salesforce development career, what would you advise? Uh, that's a great question. So again, uh, become a student of engineering and product development. You know, even if you're building a one-off application for a business unit with three people, um, don't build that application for the scale of three people. 
uh, I, uh, a mentor of mine a long time ago said, think globally, deploy regionally or locally. Mm -hmm. So even if you're building a small app, um, build it like you, like it was a product, like you're going to roll this out to millions of people. And, and the second thing is, again, um, staying outside of that just comfort zone of you, you know, doing your day-to-day -day operations and, and the stuff that you can fly through really doesn't help grow you. Uh, just get, get, just chip away outside the, outside your normal comfort zone, learn something, read some blogs, especially David's blog, get a tip from him and go try to implement it, go try to solve a problem. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, let's see here, David. Um, so you come from a very different background than Mike. Um, so you started off as a Salesforce administrator and are now a rock star developer. Um, can you share with us your career background? Thank you very much, Kim, and good to see here everyone here. Thank you for coming. So I actually started off as a professional email spammer. <laughs> um, I was literally sending out hundreds of thousands of spam emails per week and you know you can guess this was not a very fulfilling job um, it just so happened on my job that I got to dabble in code and I really loved it I loved it from the start and I loved it so much I remember telling myself you know I don't want to grow old and not you know try to become a developer and so you know for the next few months I just absorbed absorbed and read all these resources online and coded um, and then something really magical happened in my career, and that was actually meeting you, Kim Wallens Friedman. Um, met you at a developer event, and you helped me get over the hump and find my first Salesforce developer job at Box. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, from there, I moved on from Box to Google, and um, you know, now looking back, it's it's funny what some people might see to be my greatest weakness, which is my marketing background, actually turned out to be one of my greatest strengths. Um, having that different perspective really helped advance my career. Great. Um, thank you so much, David. Thank um, you, Kim. <laughs> so <laughs> can you share with us what it was about the Force.com platform that made you want to transition into development? Um, you know, kind of like Mike, I, I lucked into the Salesforce platform, um, and you know, I wanted to learn to code on any platform, and and you know, I remember actually at my company, I was kind of like the garbage man. Um, <laughs> I, I would take all these projects that no one wanted to do, um, and a lot of those projects, you know, it just so happened our Salesforce admins didn't want to do their projects, so I just I just took them all in and did it myself. Um, eventually, I became the resident expert. And since I wanted to code and I knew Salesforce so well, it made sense for me to start coding on Salesforce. Okay, great. And can you share with us one, to, one or two specific actions that you took that you believe helped to really successfully transform you into a, a legitimate Force.com developer? Yeah, you know the... The first kind of important thing that happened in my life really was meeting you, Kim, and I'm not just saying that. Um, I don't recommend everyone meet Kim, <laughs> although, you know what, that's actually not a bad idea. You should reach out to Kim. Um, but what I do recommend is um, surrounding yourself with people who you want to be like or people who are following the same journey as you. You know, go to Salesforce developer meetups. Um, you know, find a mentor or two to help really you know, guide you and keep you on track in your career. And another thing that specifically helped me uh, while learning was I drank a lot of beer. Um, more specifically, Guinness, uh, Angry Orchard, and Mike's Heart Lemonade. Um, <laughs> when you are studying you know, 10,000 hours, 10, hours to you know, become an expert on any topic, uh, you, you really cannot put in that much time without persevering and really enjoying what you're doing. Um, you know, beer helped me enjoy what I was doing, you know, have a beer while I coded. Um, but what I recommend for everyone is, you know, make the process fun for yourself. Otherwise, you're, you're yeah. going to have a really tough time persevering. I think that's a great 
point, David. Um, and so in addition to your, your beer drinking, um, what other resources did you find that you leveraged the most to kind of acquire your ultimate skills? Two in particular. One was a book called Head First Java. Head First Java. Um, I probably learned 80% of you know everything I needed to know from that book. And even though it was a book on Java, um, it had so many similarities to Apex that it really helped. Um, another resource for me, um, and back then there were a lot less resources than there are now, but another resource was, you know, I got really good at Googling things, you know, using advanced Google searches. Like, what, what I had to do was I had to, you know, Google things ten times before finally reaching out to someone to ask them that question just because you lose so much time while waiting. Um, anyways, nowadays, aside from Google, I'd recommend, you know, Salesforce has a great resource called Trailhead. Uh, which integrates your developer org and has all these lessons for coding and non-coding lessons. Uh, there's also the Stack Exchange and, and other resources online for you to find. Great. One coolest thing you've done to date on the platform? Ooh, uh, let's see. You know, what will always be my favorite project was my first uh, coding project. I remember uh, the first company I was at, I was sitting in the room, the CEO of the company, a bunch of executives, there was some emergency going on. Um, they were doing their accounting in Salesforce using financial force. And they needed to close their books out in Salesforce. And you know, they didn't they didn't have an automated process for doing it. And it was very expensive for the company. And so the company was looking to hire a Salesforce consultant developer to sort of code this accounting process in. And I remember they were looking at quotes and it was like, you know, tens and tens of thousands of dollars. And it was was absolutely ridiculous for them. And at the time I didn't know how to code, but I remember, you know, standing up in the meeting and saying, let me try to code this. You know, give me a month to code this. I'll do it for free. I'll do it in my own time. You know, if I succeed, you know, we save a lot of money. If not, you know, we lost a month, go ahead and hire your developer consulting. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I, I cranked it out and you know it ended up working. They still use it today and that was Probably one of the most important projects of my entire career. That's awesome, David. Very cool. <laughs> um, and in your opinion, being someone who did rise up through the ranks of the Salesforce community, starting as an administrator, moving into development, would you recommend that someone that's listening today who is considering their first job in, uh, around Salesforce to start out as an admin, or, or what is your advice there? Um, you know, I, I, at least thinking back when I was learning, if I was to learn again, um, if I wanted to code and I started off learning the admin stuff, it probably wouldn't be that enjoyable to me. Um, so, But what I do recommend is learn the development and the admin stuff at the same time. In mm -hmm. fact, one thing I really, really recommend is anytime you're about to code something in Salesforce, ask yourself if you can do it without code first. And, and really take a serious look if you can do it without code. I think you're going to be surprised at how much you can do without code. Mm -hmm. And so that'll really teach you the admin side while developing. Mm -hmm. And the reason that's so important is what? Ah, uh, whew. It's it's just so much easier. There's so much less maintenance. Mm -hmm. um, other people can you know see and edit your stuff a lot easier. Mm -hmm. uh, it really scales well, which is something yeah. Mike talked about. Yeah. You really want to build you know a simple org that scales very well to many users. Yeah, and then I'm going to ask a question to both of you, uh, David. I'll I'll start with you, but since you are also not only developing, but you're also now involved with hiring um, developers. Um, in your opinion, um, what do you believe developers can do to stand out from the crowd? Great question, Kim. Um, and I do want to echo what you were saying earlier, how there is such a huge shortage of developers right now. I, I don't think people fully understand how big the shortage is. Um, even major companies are willing to hire people who are who don't necessarily have the skills for the job, but uh, can learn the skills. And those companies may or may not include the company that I work for, <laughs> two positions that may or may not be reporting to me that I'm hiring for. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, 
if you're one of those people, um, what I want to recommend is to really, if you don't have the skills, really show off your growth trajectory in the platform. It's like, yes, I may not have the experience, but look, I've gotten these three certifications on my own. Or, you know, I volunteer at this nonprofit five hours a week. Or I've worked on open source projects as well. Excellent. And Mike, how about you as your, you hire for your team? What, from your opinion um, or experience, what have developers done that kind of make them stand out to you? Uh, yeah, so the first of the, to get even in the door, to even get a phone screen from my team, you have to have some uh, force.com experience because we're, we're building the product. And, and that, that force.com experience, it, just like David said, does not have to be, uh, you know, I did all the, you know, I did all these killer things. It can literally be, yeah, I volunteered at a nonprofit five hours a week and we built this cool app. It took us six months and just because of time and we, and we did it this way. Uh, so you have to have some sort of experience, even if it's personal experience, you know, yeah, I wanted to hack together a really quick uh, integration, just a proof of concept to see if Salesforce could do it. And I did it on nights and weekends and I did something. So some level of Force.com experience. Mm -hmm. and then what, what makes you stand out, what gets you the on-site interview is your passion for engineering and development, product development or uh, application development. Mm. I, I look at candidates and I think this is the same vein as what David was talking about. I don't really necessarily need to see the track record. I don't need to see the... I did these milestones on, on this type of person. What I need to see is that I have passion for what I want to do. And passion drives the you know quality. So if you enjoy something that you want to do, you get excited about I mean there's just people that just get excited about you know getting up to the governor governor limit and then being able to figure out a way to get around it. Like that there's just a certain type of person that likes that, and those are the type of people that we want to hire. So, again, I, I am not looking for the track record. In fact, I have, uh, just beca because the market is so impacted, um, I've transformed Java developers, C-sharp developers, um, PHP developers, as long as they understand object-oriented type programming. Uh, these are all the people that, you know, they have passion for technology, and they have that willingness to learn. So... Uh, you know, it's it really boils down to how you stand out is passion. Mm -hmm. uh, great, thank you. Um, and one thing I think I, I want to just insert here for any prospective um, companies that are are hiring. Yes, there is a, 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 a discrepancy between supply and demand, but not to give the message that they're not that there's no one out there. There are people out there. Um, it's just a matter of just being able to find them and attracting them in the right ways and, and that kind of thing. Um, and then Mike, um, question for you, how just over time did you, how do you ongoing, from an ongoing standpoint, continue to refine your skills? Uh, that's another great question. Uh, so, I know if you, if you just rely on the email that gets sent out of the product updates, uh, you'll probably be behind the curve. Um, you really have to get involved, and you read blogs like like David's blog, and you read uh, the posts on the forum. Um, again, when I was learning and then continuing to learn, I would I'm, being an active member of the forums uh, keeps you up to date because people ask questions. If if you missed if you missed like a feature that came out on the Apex and you didn't even, you know, like, uh, I don't know, you know, uh, back in the day, if you missed the, missed the bulk API that came out, right? Well, of course, there would be a question on the forums talking about how do you, how do you use the bulk API or I'm getting this errors message. So uh, being a contributor in the community uh, just inevitably uh, gets you community knowledge, it gets you product knowledge. Great. Um, sounds good. Um, with all that said, I am going to transition this now to um, 
open it up. We've received um, an awful lot of questions throughout today's session. And so I'm going to just um, start to call out, let's see, some of these questions. Uh, let's see here. Um, I'm just taking a look. Um, are there jobs outside of the United States? Uh, absolutely. There's positions, so to be very clear, there are Salesforce positions globally. Um, really, you name the country at this stage, and pretty much there are Salesforce developer jobs, of administrator and developer position jobs available. Another question, um, so if someone wanted to know if they're, how important are certifications? Um, so certifications are certainly, they're a, a good thing to have. Um, the, still the number one thing that employers are looking for is real world hands-on experience. So just keep that in mind as like the number one thing. And then I think the other thing that's just very helpful is taking advantage where I mentioned earlier today, Salesforce uh, has the free developer edition where you can really start to play around with that and couple that with the forums and um, you're off to a, a good start. Uh, One thing I want to add to that, Kim, yeah. uh, about the certifications is, uh, yes, certifications are very important. Experience is more important. Um, in my experience, though, what I've seen with certifications is each certification can increase your salary by five to ten thousand dollars, at least in the Bay Area. Um, so, good to know. I've I've actually just met someone who got five certifications in six weeks, starting from zero. So, that's amazing. That's very inspiring. Uh, so, David, a question that came in: um, What what are some good reading materials? I know you mentioned um, well one resource being Trailhead, but any other specific reading materials that you would use to learn? the platform? Shameless plug, I have a website that I update very often, sftc99.com. Highly recommend that. Um, Trailhead is awesome. User groups, all the, the, the official material out there is good as well. There's a class on Udacity on introduction to, to Salesforce, to force.com. Um, and definitely check out the workbooks from Salesforce. I still read those from time to time. Excellent. Um, so then there's a question here about um, could you talk about Salesforce consulting um, versus full-time positions uh, and the kind of relevant demand associated with each and I'm happy to take that one. Um, so really you see a very healthy mix of companies that are hiring both full-time permanent employees as well as contract-based. Uh, and so the nice part there is for the individuals that are doing the work is that you really kind of have a pick of your pick of the litter. There are some people that just like to have the ongoing um, projects and kind of shifting from environment to environment. And those are plentiful. Um, but there are also as companies are just um, doing more and more with Salesforce in-house, um, there are a lot of full time permanent job opportunities um, for those folks as well. Uh, let's see here. So another question is here, um, how do you transition from a developer to become an architect? Um, Mike, I don't know if you'd like to take that one. Sure. So uh, my opinion is um, to be an effective architect, you really have to, to remain a, a coder, a developer. Um, I, I, the, uh, an architect that that just sits on top of a hill and starts, you know, kind of directing his the puppets and trying to make things, you know, happen, um, is really not. Is really you want to shy away from that that sort of that sort of uh, mentality. This is just my own personal opinion. Um, so how do you make that transition? You just keep pounding code, uh, and eventually uh, those opportunities will start to to pop up for you um, uh, as you're as you're actually figuring out how this whole platform works and how everything happens. You can't you can't declare you know I I have hit the architect pinnacle um, until you've you know did that 10,000 hours that David alluded to. You have to become a master in this domain. So just keep pounding code, and eventually those opportunities will will show themselves. Okay, sounds great. Thank you. 
Uh, Completely let's... agree. Excellent. Um, perfect. Uh, let's see here. It's a question about salary ranges um, as it re relates to just different geographies. So um, what we saw today on today's slide was an average salary spanning across the U.S., uh, and the so for the for U.S. listeners and um, folks that live in the metropolitan areas, whether it be a San Francisco, New York, D.C., uh, so those are some of the areas where you're going to see are going to be higher than the average that you saw. Um, and so just to give an idea, you know, Bay Area, you see um, for a base can be a 150, 160 base, depending on experience. Um, and we've seen total comp packages this year for the first time um, exceed uh, 200. So there's just a lot of good opportunity and traction as it relates to compensation. And from a timing perspective, I'm going to keep going with a few more questions here um, for the team. Let's see here. Um, we have, um, let's see here. Okay. I think, David, you spoke to this. I don't know if there's anything you want to add, but here is an, I'm an admin without coding experience. Where do I start? You know, there are some of the best Salesforce developers I know are admins who have zero coding experience who did not have a computer science degree. Um, I really, really believe that anyone can learn how to code. Um, it doesn't matter what your background is. Um, where do you start? Start at Trailhead. Uh, check out my website. I kind of outline how I learned from going from an admin to a developer. It's sfdc99.com, um, and, and you'll find a ton of resources on both of those sites to other places where you should start looking. Okay, great. Um, someone here has a question for um, interested in becoming a I would like to add, too, uh, one of the same thing is uh, become a... Be Go ahead. Mike? Sorry, Kim. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, you're cutting out there. So I'd like to just add, uh, become a student of development. So as an admin, you have a lot of the logical and analytical skills. You, you, you know, you build a formula field that, uh, you know, cuts off the last two characters of some text box. Uh, well, that's a lot. That's it's always going to work. You did that. You, you figured out how to, how to truncate those characters and it's going to work. Well, in, in, in development, it's the same logical progression. You're just writing it out in code. So become a student of development. Uh, read those books. Understand um, that you're now solving problems with code and, and, and that your creativity or your imagination is your only limit to how you solve problems. Great. Uh, Mike, uh, back to you. Question, is it necessary to learn Salesforce's web services to become a solid developer? Yes. Um, the part of the beauty of the platform is that it can talk to other platforms. It, you know, um, communication is key both in personal life and professional life. Uh, and also within services amongst your architecture. So um, learning, not be, you know, being an, a, a quality Apex developer or an expert in Apex and Visual Force does not necessitate you having to be an expert in the web service, but you will limit yourself if you don't understand how you communicate with other systems. And a lot of those times, it's not just sending messages from Salesforce to that other system, a lot of the times is uh, helping design a system that talks to Salesforce. So being that expert that, you know, the, the Oracle guy can come to you or gal can come to you and say, hey, I want to talk, you know, I want to send you a request. How do I do that? Well, uh, you, you need to be the expert. You need to be able to say, here's, here's the protocols you use, here's how you do that, and here's the objects that you interface with. Great. Thank you. Um, so someone did ask previously about becoming a Salesforce analyst and, and what's required to become one. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll take I'll start off with that. And then David or Mike, if you have anything you want to add. So 
there are really um, two different types of analysts that we see. So one's focused on Salesforce administration and one's focused on development. Um, so typically what you would see if somebody, for example, is a, a Salesforce administrator, oftentimes they're understanding how to lift up the hood and configure Salesforce. Um, and then once they've done that for a while, may advance into an area, whether it's admin or development for that matter, where they are now interfacing with the business, really understanding business processes and coming up with ideas of how to best solution that via Salesforce. And so that's what we see with uh, analysts. It's usually just having some kind of hands-on experience, whether it be coding or administration, and then wanting to take it to the next level in terms of um, the business. Uh, and so with that said, David or Mike, if there's anything you want to add, great. Otherwise, I will continue down our list of questions. Um, okay, so I have somebody here that says that they have a about close to 10 years with uh, .NET experience. Um, how easy is it to transition um, to learn Apex? Uh, Mike or David? Okay, Mike. Yeah, I, I think that's very common. Uh, so a lot the of people transition to training. Apex. Sorry, David. Go ahead. Go ahead, David. I, I think that's it's a common path that people are doing, um, tr making that transition. And you know, it, it's not it's not very hard from what I've seen because you have that foundation of just thinking, you know, in a certain way. It's just learning a new syntax, basically. So I, I'd encourage you to make that transition. Great. And Mike. Yeah, just uh, you, you're really at that point, you're studying all the gotchas. You understand the architecture. You understand how objects are presented, how you would interface with them through a RESTful or a um, uh, service-based architecture, and you just need to understand the Salesforce limitations, where you can go, what you can, can and cannot do, uh, and how you would solve problems using that technology. Great. Um, someone here does have a request for uh, David's website, so really quickly, it's sfdc99.com. Is actually several requests for that. Uh, let's see here that there are a lot of companies that are looking for senior developers. What kind of opportunities are there for junior developers? Uh, and I'll start off in taking that one. So um, the window of opportunity for junior developers is the best it's been to date, and it's going to continue to grow and the reason for that is if we look back even four to five years ago companies at that point were only hiring a single salesforce developer not only that a lot of them were hiring someone part-time or on a contract basis it wasn't necessarily a full-time in-house position um, and at that point they were only able to take senior developers that was is it was going to be the one and only person to basically run the show now, fast forward a few years later, and you see companies that are hiring teams of Salesforce developers. Therefore, a lot of them already have senior staff on board and are able to take in somebody new to this area uh, and really mentor them. And so that window of opportunity is just, it's so ripe right now. Um, and even if it's someone, I know David and Mike have provided great tips on just getting your hands dirty somehow, whether it's um, volunteering or what have you, but any of that kind of experience that you can bring to the table and cu coupling that with, I agree with what Mike said, show, demonstrating your passion for it uh, can open up all kinds of doors presently. And I don't know, with Mike and Dave, you're both hiring. I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add to that. Uh, yeah, I'm, you know, growing a team. So just like Kim said, maybe five years ago or four years ago, I'd have one uh, developer working with me, and we'd be, you know, I, I couldn't grow that person. I couldn't take the time to mentor them or, or get them up to speed on the, on the platform. I, we're just pranking out features. Uh, but now my team structure is both senior engineers or senior developers and also junior developers. And so I think you'll find the, um, you'll find more opportunities at larger firms. I'll tell you that. So you want to go, you, if you're a junior developer and you want that experience in a structured environment, uh, you want to point towards larger firms and you also want to point towards ISVs 
uh, of the platform so that they would have the most, um, you know, the, the best nest for you to land in and to, and to learn. Great. So we have somebody that's asking the question, they have uh, 14 years experience as a project manager with some Salesforce experience who wants to go the technical route. Um, and does it make sense for them, for them to start learning Apex without prior knowledge of Java? Uh, I can say from what we've seen over the years, uh, there's no reason to not just start with Apex itself. It's similar to Java. Um, and so if Salesforce is indeed the path that you're interested in taking, I would recommend just jumping into learning Apex directly. Um, but David, um, any thoughts there or anything else that you'd want to add or have a different view? Yeah, I agree with that, Kim. I think the only reason to learn Java is because there's tons of Java resources um, and there aren't many Apex resources. Nowadays, there's a lot more Apex resources, so it makes sense to jump straight into Apex. Um, if you're if you're looking for like a book on Apex, though, you might have trouble finding one. Uh, but there's tons of great Java books out there. So it really depends on what medium you prefer to learn in. Uh, for me, I like books, and I started with Java. Uh, but but you definitely don't need to do that. Okay, terrific. Um, let's see here. A question, and we're going to be wrapping this up here briefly. Uh, is is it better to um, from an earning and learning perspective, um, to be a senior developer or to go the architect route. Uh, and that, I will say, uh, is that is really a personal preference. Um, certainly, as you continue to grow your skills, you do become more marketable and therefore salary is going to be commensurate with that. There's not a drastic change, but there is a change. But ultimately, it's are you enjoying your time? Are you enjoying spending your time hands-on coding? Or are you enjoying your time more kind of solutioning and coming up with design work? And so I think that's just a very, you know, personal choice in terms of, you know, learning opportunities. Um, and then the... Final question uh, I see here is, is a, a layup. Will the recorded session? Will this be um, recorded and available later? And the answer to that is, is yes. It will be. It is being recorded and will be available um, within a week's time. And everyone that registered for today's webinar will be um, receiving an email notifying them of when this goes live. With that said, um, there is a survey, um, feedback. Salesforce really appreciates receiving feedback on these types of calls. So if you have it, um, it would be very appreciated, appreciated if you could take 60 seconds to fill that out. And there is also a referral program here. Take a look at that link. And if um, you do, maybe you get to win a good prize. And lastly, I just want to take a moment to first of all thank everybody that's listening in on today's call. Um, I especially want to thank both Mike and David for taking their time out to participate. It's super appreciated and it's been super fun to work with you both. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to us at Higher On Demand. Um, you have our, the Twitter handles at Higher On Demand. You can reach us directly. Um, you've also seen Mike and Dave's contact information, and we'll be happy to answer any questions after this webinar. Higher on demand, I know will be.